in series of the webinars from the APNA Merit Subcommittee. And uh, I'm your host. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Sarfaz Asni. I'm a rheumatologist by training. And I'm a clinical researcher and director of the Lupus Clinical Research at the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda, Maryland. And our moderators uh, today are uh, Dr. Sayed Uzair. And Dr. Akhtar has also joined us. Uh, he has been a long uh, supporter of uh, APNA Merit. So as many of you know, uh, APNA Merit is a platform where uh, we bring uh, the clinical uh, research landscape uh, along various parts of the uh, Pakistan. And we started out with, uh, with the US and then we moved on. Uh, and every two weeks, uh, we join uh, at 9 p.m. of Pakistan time and 11 a.m. U.S. Eastern time. Uh, so today, uh, we have uh, Professor uh, Habib Bukhari joining us, uh, who is uh, uh, talking about the plan uh, Pakistan Clinical Research Landscape, Comsats University. So a brief introduction about uh, Professor Bukhari is that he is uh, the, he's currently serving as the founding vice chancellor of the Kohasar University in Murray. He received a PhD from the University of Glasgow as on a Commonwealth scholarship and is a recipient of uh, Commonwealth uh, London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and Fulbright scholarships at UPenn. So top leading institutes in the world. And he has more than 26 years uh, career where he has supervised um, lots of students, research and has uh, a long list of uh, publications on health and cum and his cumulative impact factor of uh, of around 500 and he has seminal work in understanding the climate sensitive diseases and it has been well acknowledged around the world uh, for his work he has won various international and national grants and uh, his primary uh, focus of interest of research is epidemiology and surveillance of pathogens um, and uh, he has also worked on um, some uh, tropical diseases such as whooping cough, diarrhea, um, and more recently on COVID-19. Um, his work in Pakistan, understanding obesity, diabetes, fetal birth, and colorectal cancer, um, and also uh, role of extended growth in association with microbial diversity. Um, and uh, he is also engaged, uh, identified a novel uh, fluorescent protein and has been engaged in promoting STEM education in Pakistan. And before we started, he also mentioned that he has worked on some nanotechnology. So a wide er um, area of research and a very well accomplished person. And we are really honored and uh, thankful that Professor Bukhari has taken time out of his busy schedule to uh, enlighten us about the research landscape. So before for the, uh, so without further ado, I will hand it over to Professor Bukhari. Just um, um, housekeeping rule is that please keep yourself mute and um, turn your videos off while we while he's presenting. And if you have questions and answers, there is a Q and A. Um, just click that on at the bottom of your screen, and uh, we will try to get to as many questions as possible. And if there are questions that we are not able to get to, we'll try to see if we can get those answers later on. So, uh, Professor Mubi uh, Bukhari, again, welcome, and thank you so much, and please uh, take it away. Bismillah ar Thank you very much, uh, Sir Prasad, for your kind introduction, and thank you very much, Sayyid Uzay Sahib and Apna Merit, for having me and giving a chance to you know speak about some of the work which we have been doing uh, using your platform. So, if I may start in the best interest of a time, if you can, you know, allow me to move to my first slide because it seems I've stuck somewhere. If you can start that, can you see my screen, Sir Prasad? Can you can you see my screen? Yeah, we can see your screen. We can see your screen, and it's talking about some relevant publications. But if if we can put it okay. go to the first so, slide, if somehow it looks like if if you allow okay. me to. It's basically on your side. You have to uh, move the slides. Let so maybe see. you can stop uh, screen sharing and then share it again. It would work. Yeah, let me do that. Yeah. Sure. We need to keep the deck ready with you as well. Sure.
So while we are working through some technical uh, issues, I think um, most of you uh, or have already joined the WhatsApp group and uh, are aware of the our YouTube channel. But if you're not, please, uh, all of these webinars are archived in our YouTube channel, and there are tons of resources uh, for clinical research in the um, in the WhatsApp group. So you can certainly do that. So uh, we are seeing your uh, screen, uh, Dr. Bukhari, which is uh, showing the presenter view. So. Just go to the now, now you can see that, yeah. Let me. Is that yeah, okay perfect. now? Oh, okay. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Perfect. Okay, the topic which has been assigned to me rather by Professor Dr. Sayyid Zaysa is about you know, talking about my experience regarding the clinical research landscape in particular in my previous organization. So I'll be speaking on that. And before uh, I start, it's it's entirely important that, you know, the topic which we have been given to me, a few days back, I've been asked on a TV interview that what are the few areas which you like to see that this government, which is whichever government is coming, is going to be working on in order to address the pressing challenges. So the one of the challenge which I, you know, Uh, mention about uh, primary health. Primary health is a key area where we feel in the primary education. Well, these are the two main areas where we need to focus in order to build our youth workforce for the future uh, so that they, all the pressing challenges which we are facing should be addressed adequately. So there's a huge background for that and I'll try to link that background in one way or other way during this 30-40 uh, minutes marathon talk as well. So Clinical landscape. Now, before I you know, move to the some of the research agenda, let me introduce Comsets. Comsets was a, my second organization in 96. I started from Bahawalpur University as a, as a, as a lecturer, teaching undergrad and grad students. In uh, 2002, three, we started life sciences uh, department in Comset, introduced as the first faculty, along with one of my senior colleagues, uh, late Shahzad Mufti Saab. So we were both basically sitting in a small barrack and starting this whole of, you know, complete new department in, in, a, in an IT center institution. Now, currently, there's seven campuses of this institution. There are about 40,000 students. So we started with about 18 students intake. And at the moment, this, it has about 100 PhD faculty members alone in this biosciences faculty. And one of the top uh, institutions in terms of producing life uh, publication in an area of life sciences, and I would so just a few years back, it was a number one in terms of a life sciences publication. And I still, I believe it is the number one in terms of uh, papers or research coming out of, in the form of a publication. About more than 50,000, 40,000 students. There are quite a few number of foreign students. So there are a number of departments and faculties, which we started, are listed on the left side. And the number on the campuses, you see the first one is basically a, a palm sets. We have seven campuses, a number of students, faculty, and programs. And on the bottom is a new university, which I started in March 2021 as the first vice chancellor. And we have at the moment about 1,500 students, 75% are girls among these students. And there are a number of programs, which are about 18 active programs so on the right side of my uh, screen are mentioned here, which we have been about 40 PhD faculty members are basically with us. Now, coming to the overview regarding this particular topic now, overview of a health research and clinical research landscape, I'll just give you a brief introduction what is happening on this front overall in Pakistan and then specifically moving towards the concepts. Now, if you look at, uh, you're all familiar with the fact that there are certain organizations like NIPSI was being formed. In the 80s, 90s was the time, and it was basically picking up. And, and, and it, there were about 30 new organizations of similar uh, type, which have been formulated and working in different cities. And it was basically given a mandate that is going to be an organization which will be producing and working in industry and design, food and textile. And then the camp was also there. And then hepatitis B vaccine, interferon, and it's so fighting. And these are the kind of a mandate and agenda which was associated with these organizations. And then PCSIR is there. And then 
I'm also mentioning here in the middle, the concepts, uh, we're basically we're working mainly in the area of like artificial skin, autograph, gentle materials, and genetic disorders, cancer, infectious disease. So these are the common topics of research agenda generally, which are basically in this particular area, which are you know, clinical research area, I can uh, link it with those, uh, uh, with, the, with, the, with the, the current topic. So these are the topics or agenda, broad topics, which are being taken up by various faculty members. Then we have a nurse, Nam Zaga Khan, Health Service Academy, and more recently in NIH, we've been working in this area for some time and then we have a huge number of public health sector universities which are more or less working in a similar kind of areas in, a, in, a, in a, most of the time in, in an area where basically uh, some new uh, avenues have also been added where the interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary areas have been introduced where a lot of people are working together in order to address the health issues and agenda so this is something which have been you can find in some of the universities these are the strong interdisciplinary groups but most of them are lacking that interdisciplinarity work together. So that's something which we need to focus and keep that mind, key word in mind as a take home message later on. And on the middle of the side, if these are the areas, epidemiology, preventive uh, medicines, vaccines, AMR, model organisms, animals, and other biomaterials, biomanufacturing and bioprocessing. This is something which a lot of uh, the universities are working, but what level and what sort of a quality is being coming out of that is some something which we need to basically discuss. So if you look at that uh, on the bottom, there's a system biology, one has in genomics, metagenomics and microbiome as, are the areas where a lot of publications are coming out in this particular area. And then on the right side, if I look at the number, this is something statistics which I got from the net, where we see what sort of a challenges and problems we are facing as a part of Pakistan, in terms of a different diseases, if you look at the number uh, and percentage and statistics of these diseases and prevalence, right, right from the cardiovascular, and, you know, all those fever paralysis and so these are the percentages which has given to the circulating between 25, 30 percent to below down to the one percent or some somehow like that. So I just give you a summary where uh, towards the end there's a one of the major agenda which I'm going to take up as one small case study is stunting, and if you look at the infectious diseases mainly in the bottom respiratory, you know, gastroenteritis, diarrhea, viral hepatitis, dengue, COVID recently, and so on and so forth. And Wupika is one of the other area, pneumonia, which is which is quite prevalent in this country. So by I'm trying to mention that how relevant our research is to these topics. That's something which we need to also look at that as well, and where the priorities falls in and how basically different uh, uh, universities and different organizations are working to address these pressing agendas and main agendas. And looking at the number and statistics of our public health infrastructure, as you're all aware of the fact, it's very weak in terms of a number of hospitals, cater the needs of a huge population, and look at the number of you know, these basic health unit dispensaries and you know, child health care units, mother and child health care. So they're all numbers are quite, you know, bismal and weak, and in terms in terms of that, how we can basically simply addressing few pressing challenges, which I mentioned on the right corner, we can basically address uh, in, in, in our resource deficient countries like Pakistan, some of the problems and pressing agendas in order to reduce the pressure on the existing weak healthcare system. So if we move on to the next, perhaps slide is, oh, okay. My net internet is a little weak. I think it's take me time to move on to the next. So this is what basically I've tried to give a sustainable development goals. Now that's where the, if we link and map the sustainability with the bioeconomy, so this is something which I've just given over the years. I've given you a small you know, background, what sort of a challenges we are facing and how basically we are trying to link those challenges with our, our research in our laboratory, in a small resource deficient laboratories in order to address those challenges and create some knowledge and fill in those gaps so somebody can build further work on those small knowledge or you know, research which we produce in order to address those major challenges. And you can look at those sustainable development goals. And if I basically move on to the next slide, where all those areas which are mentioned here are I think I'm stuck somewhere. Oh, okay. Now, I let me. 
So all those areas which I mentioned here are uh, how they are impacting the human health in general, but how the child and a mother health is being impacted is the most important. As I said, the primary health is one of the major agenda which we need to address. And how we are doing it that because of the sustainable development goals right from you know, beginning poverty, reducing poverty, quality education, hunger, and then at this clean and uh, drinking water, climate change agenda on top of that is also impacting all those, so achieving those sustainable development goals, which are basically also centered around the primary health and impacting that as well. So if we try to see that how the wastewater management systems and how those infectious diseases which are associated with the frequent floods and many other you know, global warming and, and, and its, uh, challenges such as dengue and such as diarrhea, such as you know this waste management, the colossal waste we are using in a similar daily sanitation and hygiene practices and how basically we are also practicing livestock, you know, dealing with the poultry and a livestock at home and how they are basically impacting the health is something which has not been addressed uh, properly in a and that's what we're basically trying to give a few case studies, which we have basically been engaged over the years in order to Can you hear me okay now? I think there's been a problem with my net. Can you hear me okay? Sir Prasad, can you hear me okay? Yes, go ahead, uh, Professor. It's Sir Francis, clear. I know uh, some interruptions, but this is better now. GG. Okay. Okay. Now this is where basically, as I mentioned in my previous slide, that what is the black box of infectious disease and how we can address different challenges pressing and present in our country. On my left side, if you see all those green circles, are the one where a lot of diarrheal diseases have been addressed, and I'm going to see that how basically this information. And a knowledge can be translated into some sort of a knowledge which can be used by the physician in order to address those challenges. That is something which we wanted to establish a gap where the epidemiologists, where the researchers can work and give some sort of a knowledge and create some sort of knowledge where the epidemiologists, where the clinicians or physicians can work together and create an interdisciplinary research groups in order to address those challenges and come up with some sort of a interventions to develop certain interventions in order to contribute in this particular area in terms of. Uh, not only producing a, you know, certain uh, marketable products, but also addressing the basic health issues as well. So this is something which I've been working on for some time. And then there are certain other areas which we work on the multi-drug resistance, you know, can see those all escape organisms mentioned in the in a, in a next uh, circle with the Klebsiella, pneumonia, and you know, Pseudomonas, Serogenas, Sysorius, the, all those organisms were basically, and these were the patients which were basically recruited from the skin patients, extremely drug resistance, uh, uh, isolated from the hospital wards. So we have basically done some work on that. And then we also did some work where the etiology of a bacteria has been established with certain diseases. For example, obesity was, there was a complete lack of a data, how the gut has been microbiome is associated with the micro with the obese population of Pakistan, how the gut microbiome is associated with the diabetic population of Pakistan, and how it is associated with the preterm deliveries and premature births. And one more interesting area is a colorectal cancer. We have also seen one of those etiology, which I've mentioned here, E. coli, has been producing those genotoxin molecules, which have been basically reported in one of our paper where we've seen this is the first time that a colibactin has E. coli has been positively associated with certain cancers in patients in Pakistan as well. So this, this is the other kind of a thing which I've been doing. So I will focus on a couple of case studies for this in the best interest of the time here. Now, the first case study, or no, this is basically a, the three case studies I picked out of those the few work which have been, some of the work which I've done, Campy, Cholera, and COVID-19 recently, more recently. So now I'll just speak about those three case studies, what we have done over the years, and try to link it with the primary health, not the COVID, but, but the first two ones.
Now, as you are all aware of the fact that there are a lot of emerging diseases which are basically giving a hard time. Uh, and, and, and you can see now, every now and then there's a whole list of those pathogens which are causing different diseases. They have a different origin of a host and they have a different origin and different host. And if you remember that SARS CoV 1 started from a wet market and then somebody who was traveling from the China's wet market into the Metropole Hotel. Uh, and then basically that was the area where a lot of people were infected in one of the conference and about there were a few thousand cases, not a lot. And if you can imagine the, the cost, it has basically resulted in terms of uh, producing a damage to the global economy was a huge, where it was estimated there are total 8,000 cases. And it was estimated that there are about 200, let me see. I think my... Slide is not moving. Let me see. Stuck. So, as I said, that there were a huge uh, a loss, economic loss, and if I correctly remember, two million dollars per case, eight thousand total cases, and two million dollars per case was the cost estimated. And you can imagine how many people were affected during this SARS-CoV-2 episode, and that. Estimate damage estimate has to be yet to be calculated. It goes beyond doubt trillions of dollars. Now, what we did because because we were given a challenge when in Comset about five years ago, four years ago, one of my Egyptian students, and we started working on that. But we got that, and the wastewater epidemiology is one of the major uh, factor, which which one of the major technology which was being used for the polio in Pakistan. So we basically started working on that and started developing. Uh, a quick diagnostic uh, toolkit in order to uh, for the effective surveillance of the water bodies for detecting uh, COVID-19 SARS-CoV-2 in those uh, in those water bodies, and we've been able to successfully develop a microfluidic chip where the interdisciplinary areas, as I said, comes into play, and we basically use its real time. You know, one of the small. Uh, a very cost-effective technology of using a sensitive uh, detection method of using these polymerase chain reaction and linking and, 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 and integrating with the, uh, the, the, with the the microfluidic chip for detection because of a calorimetric assay. So you can easily detect that. And that, that basically worked very well. And we've been able to develop this technology in a protocol and, 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 and reported that at that time. But somehow, as I said, the resource deficient laboratories are lagging much behind in terms of access to the resources. We've not been able to basically take full advantage of this. But we published that a, a little later because the pace of research is all dependent on a, how much basically investment is going on into that research. So with this was research which was basically we're doing it at our own resources within our own laboratory using some of the research uh, funding from here and there. And in, in, in from the ongoing projects in order to support this project, but it worked very well. So this is how the technology basically worked. As I said, this is this is a loop mediated isothermal amplification, a lamp integrated with the microfluid fluidic devices and the color changes are mentioned in these small tubes, and you can do this reaction within 45, 50 minutes. In order to detect that in NNF. This, it's, there has been a debate and issues with the sensitivities, but it worked well in principle. So I just wanted to show that one of the work which we have done on, in, in, in this particular area. I'm sorry, my slides are because we're trying to move it quickly, but they are stuck and it's taking quite a while to move. So this is some Dr. Of the actually, uh, we are sharing your slides. You just uh, you can just say next slide. Oh. Okay, brilliant. That that makes much because I thought I was a country in control. So that, that makes much, you know, will make much easier. As I said, $2 million per case. So these are the, some of the published work which we have done in this particular area. So these are all available online regarding the you know, diagnostics area. So if we move on to the next slide, please. One of the major areas, now just if you go, go back, go back, if you can please go back. What? 
if you get, can go back please to, to the previous slide. So one, one of the area which we have seen, which is world has yet to see the impact of that is the co-infection, because we've already seen the dengue in this country. And this was the first report from this anywhere, I believe from the world, where we have seen the co-infection of a COVID-19 and dengue and the damage done to the, to the, to the, to the patients. And we've been looking for those preterm deliveries and association of those with these co-occurrence of these two etiologies. And, uh, and we are also looking at the immune response, such as interleukin and all those different immune players who are basically uh, also uh, being, uh, uh, how they're basically inducing all the different immune response in different age groups and the ones which have been given different vaccines as well. So that's something which we are currently looking at. Now we can move to the next slide, please. Now, the other case was the Campylobacter jejuni. It's a very, you know, it's an organism which causes gastroenteritis. It's also involved in a Guillain Bay syndrome, GBS. We have reported a few cases from Pakistan and in association with the King Edward Medical University. So we've been working with them for the past eight or 10 years on this particular area. And gathered all those samples from those children which were facing, you know, this, this the uh, guess, not only the gastroenteritis, but also later on, that the third part will be on stunting cases were recruited from the King Edward Medical University by students who are working with them closely and getting all those samples. But here it's important to mention that Campylobacter jejuni is one of the key organisms which has been implicated in association with the stunting as well. So, and it's also causing the bloody diarrhea in some of the cases because of a kind of virulent organisms, virulent genes associated with this organism. So we have been able to basically isolate these uh, organisms from various sources, right from the first of all, right from the environment from where the, these babies were basically being affected. We got those hospitalized cases, hospitalized children, and also uh, identify the etiology. And then we have certain so developed uh, in, in my laboratory, along with my partner, the source tracking markers, which have all been reported. So all we need to do, those source tracking markers are like exactly like a beaks, which can help us in identifying that from which source these organisms are entering into the human gut or a child gut, whether they are coming from a water source, they are coming from a livestock or a poultry or a waste. So this is something which we have done in this country excessively and basically been able to identify the exact source of getting these pathogens into the, into the, into the human gut or a child gut or a vulnerable gut gut and there are certain coding sequences also known as a contingency loci which are which are the hyper virulent uh, uh, plastic plasticity regions which allow us to detect all those beaks or sources and all them of them are highlighted here in the yellow you can see there's a hypothetical proteins and there are some of them are lipo lipo oligosaccharide molecules and opposite, uh, capsule modifications minor protein or cap protein which can be used uh, as, a, as a plus minus if we can identify them. Move to the next slide, please. On the right side, you can see all those clusters of. Now, this cluster which I've shown you above is based on a presence or absence of these different genes, which I've shown you on the genome of the backbone of this Campylobacter jejuni, whether they are present or not present, based on their presence or absence. We can divide them into a different clusters, whether they're coming from uh, wastewater source, livestock source, or a poultry source. So that's a simple uh, strategy which we adopted, and we've been able to identify a huge number and also identify not only their uh, association, but we are, uh, from different sources. But we've also been able to identify uh, the drug resistance which have been associated with those different bacteria as well. So that's an additional thing which we've also been identified, and uh, uh, so that this can give information which which source is basically. Uh, it is a source of a spread of a superbugs or a Campylobacter jejuni, which are associated with the uh, drug resistance and coming from which source because, as you know, this can be used as a growth promoter. Some a lot of drugs can be used, antibiotics are being used still as a growth promoter in the poultry industry, and this is something which is a uh, big thing which needs to work out in the future as well. Move on to the next slide, please. Now, other thing is the virulence, as I said, that Campylobacter jejuni can also, this gastroenteritis bug can also cause the bloody diarrhea. So we have done this global study along with the London School of Hygiene where with three different countries participated in the studies and we from Pakistan basically uh, studied Pakistani isolate and we have seen that there are very 
some of the strains which we cause cause in like in the countries involved UK, Vietnam, and Pakistan. So some of the strains which were causing the bloody diarrhea have been associated with certain type six excretion systems. Type six excretion system is one of the bacterial machinery which is allowed to basically inject the virulence uh, factors into the host are directly using this machinery. And one of the uh, the player in this machinery is the uh, HCP protein which we worked on. And HCP protein has a uh, because this was something which we identified for the and then resolved its structure. If you can move on to the next slide, please. This is a string like complete machinery, type 6 fission machinery, which allows to basically transfer the virulence uh, material directly into the host. Uh, Dr. Sam, if you can move to the next slide, please. Next slide. So this is where the, basically we identified the structure of this protein for the first time and reported that from Pakistan HCP1 structure protein, and it can help us in basically it's a useful drug target. And now we can basically use it in a clinical research. As I said, I'm trying to link it with some you know, future work as well. And there can be useful studies carried out on this in order to develop and effectively control this disease. Move on to the next slide, please. So this, this is some of the work which have been done, including those structural work uh, on, on compiler back to Janai. Uh, the, the, if you move on to the next slide, please. Next, please. Yeah, one more. Now, this was the cholera study, as cholera is one of the major... Yeah, just move back, move back. So cholera has been basically, this is 2010 floods, and then we covered it 2000. The recent floods as well. So we've been working consistently into 2009, 10 to 2013 uh, on cholera and gathering all those samples and genomically identify what sort of a strain and types are circulating within a country so that it can help us in order to be aware of uh, the local isolates and so that uh, so, so we can should be basically develop a strategy to control that or even to do the surveillance and detect that how these organisms are evolving and what sort of it a pathogenic uh, uh, mechanisms that are associated with these organisms to cause the virulence. So these are the few pictures from our studies. If you move on to the next slide, please. So this is a, the, a little bit, you know, simple way of explaining the how the cholera genome looks like. There are two circular pro chromosomes. There are different virulence factors associated with the, the region one and chromosome one and chromosome two are mentioned on left and right. Move on to the next slide, please. What we did basically, we did the surveillance across the Pakistan, right from the Karachi to Nushera and Khyber Pakhtunkhwa during the floods, and identified genomically two different unique substrains which were causing cholera. You can see the red and blue. So you can see the 2009 and 10. There was most of the time in the top slide was a blue with the one there one side a type of a strain which was circulating, which we call it a Pakistan subclade two and. If If you look at the 2011 and onwards, it all become red. I'm not showing here 13 data. You can see on, on, on my right side where the phylogenetic tree is showing that how they are linked with the global isolates. There are 46 genomes are basically compared here. And we have a unique isolate close to Nepal and Haiti isolate. So this gives us information that what sort of a strains we are dealing and how basically any foreign introduction is happening in the future. That can be basically easily mapped based on this data. Every evolution changes because cholera is also quite a plastic genome. It keeps on changing. So every evolution, evolution change that happens can also be basically linked to this as well. So if we move on to the next slide, please. Now, this basically shows you the, 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 the genomic structure of these different uh, organisms. What sort of a deletions are there? What sort of a uh, structure look like, which move on to the next slide. Uh, one more, click, click one more. Yeah. So this basically gives us some, some idea that how they are different from each other and that helps us in order to study them as well. What sort of a wellness they carry. One of the models, one of the models where the clinical researchers use different models, animal models. So I basically for the first time developed this insect model called a Galeria malonella for identifying the virulence for, so for understanding the virulence of these organisms rather than moving to the next slide and it worked very well. So I've shown you this model here as well. Uh, and that's something which we would easily bring it on undergraduate education as well and as well as graduate education where the preliminary information needs to be gathered. 
So this, this model is now being used in many other diseases as well, very well as well. So in order to detect how PSC1 and how PSC2 is virulent, uh, which one is more virulent, so this can be easily uh, determined uh, using this, 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 uh, this sort of model. So this was developed as well in one of our study as well. Please move on to the next. So the information we gather from out of this, that how because we can link physicians, as I said, uh, and epidemiologists using this kind of information where the gen genomics can help us in understanding the complete antibiotic susceptibility, susceptibility patterns. For example, it becomes much easier for a physician. If we look at that, we say that, what does that mean if the 200,000 physician has a certain SNP which can confer a tetracycline resistance? Now, it can become much easier for us uh, for the improve, uh, improved, which improve the usefulness of this strategy. And that's the gap which we are trying to see and fill that how this genomics can be translated and brought into the laboratories in order to address uh, and, and, and in prescription as well. So this is something which can be used and normally used in some of the developed countries, but it's not as frequently being used. So this is something which is going to happen mostly because as the technology is becoming more, it's cheaper and cheaper. Move on to the next slide, please. So these are the, some publications which we have done on, on, on this work as well, cholera work. Please move on to the next one. Now, the, that's something which is interesting. Now, I'm trying to basically merge all those things which we have just discussed, Compilobacter, and if you look at that, rotavirus, E. coli, different E. coli pathotypes, ETEC, EPEC, EHEC, the rotaviruses, noroviruses. So these are the different viruses. Uh, bacteria and viruses and, uh, and which have been basically linked with the stunting. The stunting, as you're all aware of the fact, is something which basically we feel that Pakistan with the 37% children living with this uh, disease. Uh, and it's not only the nutrition, as you all are aware of the fact, because there are certain factors which are contributing towards this. Uh, one of them is obviously micronutrients and nutrition, but the other factor is obviously the primary health, how the mother and child health has been taken care of, and how the sanitation hygiene conditions are prevailing around this, you know, this vulnerable population is quite important in terms of addressing that as well. And a lot of countries have basically able to do that by combining all these together. And, and then obviously the animal protein also plays a critical role. As I said, one act can be, you know, but Cuba has been the country which has shown that practically that a 47% and children were basically, by giving one egg for about six or nine months, they've been able to reduce that to 47%. So that, and provided that other factors are also being taken care of. And we can do that as well, because you know, uh, this, the major thing is that it can cause about 7.6% uh, uh, billion annual loss due to the stunting. We have seen that in this country uh, uh, globally, and we have also seen the impact of this in this country as well. You can imagine that 25 million children out of 26 million children out of the school, and uh, uh, well, there's quite possibility there's a huge link between this and stunting, which needs to be yet to be established uh, on a sound ground as well. So as it's also basically to reduce the you know, uh, more daily disability uh, associated work. Uh, basically, you can um, imagine that it basically reduce the productivity and, and it can also reduce the lifespan, in other words, because there are a lot of other diseases, but somebody children, the, the studies have shown that the people, children which have been living with this uh, disease later on also were able to release other diseases as well, and which can also reduce their productivity as well. So this, this, this statistic is quite high. If you can move on to the next slide, if you click it on the right side, there, you can see that if you, yeah, on, in the right side, you can see that this was the, one of the prize which was given uh, three or four years ago, and the global pri the Nobel Prize was given for the study, where basically they have shown that how the it is key to focus on a primary health to address such issues so that the productivity can be enhanced, and which has a strong link with the economic growth of a country as well. Move on to the next slide, please. Next, please. So we have basically established and shown this microbiome association with the stunting children from Pakistan and how they basically, this, this slide has shown that how basically the physical 
growth and the cognitive growth is being impacted by the presence of different different organism in a gut, gut which basically allow uh, the, it leads to the inflammation of intestine, which can basically lead to the absorption, misabsorption, uh, underabsorption of the nutrient, whatever will be taken up 10 or 15 percent is being passed through the fecal material being, being unused and already undernutrition uh, population has become under severe stress because of the presence of these microorganisms, which we have shown in our study and recent report from the scientific uh, published in the scientific report. If we move on to the next slide, please, we just come to the closer because we have about five minutes left. So let's you know finish this. So what we've been doing in order to, because as I said, how we can link from one to another study, what we have been doing in from Kosa University, Murray, you know, this lot of sanitation, hygiene, education, a lot of waste management, education, Murray, the place where we will feed that lot of uh, colossal waste uh, is basically damaging not only the biodiversity, but also the open sewage system and all the waste being thrown and dumped at, 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 at not any specified point is causing a lot of damage and the run of water is leading to the, the contaminating all these water bodies and end up basically causing a disease as well. So we've started to working on a circular economy and using these small insects. As I mentioned earlier, there's another sister insect which can basically use as a you know, converting this waste or a food waste into a value addition, something which we are working and we've been able to do that in our resource deficient laboratory, we're working on a pilot project of that as well. So this is one way of not only uh, teaching the community, we have teased, have taught about 100 households about how to dispose this waste properly so that we can gather those waste and take it to our facility and do the, all the research work, which we have just mentioned. It becomes easy. And we're also trying to see that how we can incentivize that later on for sustainability uh, purpose as well. So this is something which we are trying to taking a message from the whatever knowledge we have created and giving the solution is something which we are working at the moment. Move on to the next slide, please. It's one of the way of basically addressing this. Next slide, please. So these are the few pictures which we have been working on a sanitation hygiene during the floods and many other uh, and, and in terms of training our communities. Uh, in, 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 in terms of how to manage, manage the waste. And then basically, and this is a small toilet project with a lot of you know, toilets were washed away during the 2020, 2020, 2022 floods. We've been able to basically help in one way or the way in order to address those challenges, especially the young women. Move on to the next slide. Next, please. Some of the work which we have done regarding stunting, preterm deliveries, and how these etiologies and microbes have been causing that. So this is the last uh, few slides, but the last category is that how the clinical research. Now, where we are standing at the moment, the synthetic biology is one of the area where we feel that if this is something which is, 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 is something which. Uh, has been already commuted. This recent thing has been contributing a lot in terms of producing those molecules or recombinant vaccines. One of them, which have been also worked in London School of Hygiene, where these glycoengineering platforms basically present in the bacteria can be used in order to produce the inexhaustible amount of vaccines. And they were using this for the livestock vaccine. So they have basically developed a spin out company, uh, which was funded by one of the start Cordon president, and you know, uh, this is a venture capital. In, in Cambridge. So they were basically working on that, and I had a chance to work on that and basically worked on one of the enzymes which is involved called Pegel B, it's called a glycotransferase enzyme, which basically you're all familiar with the fact that a lot of glycone, glycanes, or antigens can be used, are being used in the past as a vaccine antigens. But now, what does basically this platform means that we produce them within a bacteria, and that was chemically synthesized and attached to the molecule. Uh, any molecule for to become as a vaccine, but they can be synthesized right together in one of the bacteria where they have a, this, this machinery can chemically, sorry, uh, can produce those antigens and lock them onto that particular protein, which has to be basically uh, need to be decorated with certain glycanes in order to make them effective molecules for to be used as a vaccine. So this is something where the glycans transferases enzyme, which once they are produced, are the one which transferred them to the target site. So that's what, how that's a critical step. Which, if they are made, being efficient in order to transfer them to the site, they can be very useful in terms of uh, uh, producing quickly those molecules and vaccine antigens. So move on to the next slide, please. 
So this is some small work which we have done, but how to basically engage the youth, as I mentioned in the STEM. So we used a similar kind of a platform, as I said, in a victory and wanted to show our, engage our youth that how genetic engineering or recombinant DNA technology is being carried out within a bacteria, if they can see it by the naked eye, how the bacteria look like expressing those molecules. And we use one of those molecules, which I have happened to work in George Mason about 2005, identified a couple of novel process protein, and we express them in a bacteria and we express them in a mammalian cells in order to excite those students. So this is something which I'm currently working on trying to see if we can develop a small toolkit for engaging and in, in, in involving youth in biotechnology. And so that once they understand the excitement in this area, so they can go move towards applied area, as I mentioned earlier. So this is something which I'd like to do that. Uh, move on to the next slide, please. Next slide. Uh, so, okay, now this is the industry, as I said, how it looks like. If you look at the diagnostic and biological or clinical research landscape, Synthetic biology is obviously it's going to be a multi-billion dollar, trillion dollar industry in future as well. So that's where basically it's some, some, some sort of a debate is going on in a country. But how, and these are the areas where the, these clinical research, preclinical research, clinical research, ethics, and all those regulatory information walks in. And we have not been able to basically take advantage of that because of a poor infrastructure or, 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 or regulatory uh, framework existing at the moment, but people are working on that. Once that is happening, then it becomes much easier to take advantage of this particular area in order to produce and uh, address, uh, produce certain molecules or recombinant molecules within such systems, and then can be basically marketable as well. It can generate a lot of economy and re a, a lot of income in future as well. Move on to the next slide, please. So this is I'm going to be last slide. I wanted to share a certain statistics the way I wanted to see that how the landscape of higher education and landscape of research obviously is built on that look like in the world. We look at the number of high income countries, gross enrollment, and look at the Muslim world. We are also about 20%, 21%. Like and then the pace of a change in gross enrollment, we have seen about 16%. We look at the in, in, in the low income country of Pakistan, and look at the global innovation index, which is directly linked with this. With, None of the Muslim countries in top 30. And if you look at the landscape of higher education, why it is happening, look at the investment and look at the number of students engaged in higher education, 2.3 million in UK alone, a small country. Look at the US 20 million students, more than that even. Brazil is about 8 million, where you're sitting around North America. Look at the China, 30 million higher education. So the brain, which is involved in higher education and producing a research is a huge number and we have yet to work on that. We've not been able to, we have the, the, about 4,000 universities alone in the US and we are in a, still a debate that how many universities we should have. So this is the kind of a debate we are at the moment engaged in. And if similarly, if you look at the people who are involved in the Western countries spending a lot of money on GDP, about 4%, 3%, that's the range. And look at Pakistan, look at the technology and the skill area where they're basically investing in even hardly any 0 0.1 or 0 0.001% in only skill education. So then look at the higher education. It's even, you know, number is compared to the 4% only in higher education. Look at Pakistani statistics is much, much lower than that. So we have to invest on that as well in, in order to basically, you know, translate our knowledge into some sort of a product and it can generate income. And this is something which we are lacking and we need to work on that. Higher Education Commission recently has been working for the past 10 or 15 years, been able to do some, uh, accumulate a lot of knowledge, but we are stuck at a prototype and taking that to the next level is something which we need to work. So that's the last mile basically, which is lacking and we have to basically, that's where the interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary areas are vital and people working in a different domains need to get together in order to you know, take that to the uh, to the next level. Move on to the next slide, please. I think that's the last slide. I really... Yes, that's the last slide. Yeah. Thank you very much. So this is just a slide. I just gave you that huge information is out there. Uh, that's a small genetic code of one of the protein which I just worked on, but that has to be converted into a knowledge and knowledge into a converted into a product is something which we need to work as long as our systems are you know, in place. Thank you very much, uh, Sir Prasa, for listening. Thank you very much. Uh...
you can just have uh, the stop sharing the screen that will help uh, <clears throat> so thank you uh, dr bukhari uh, that was excellent overview and i think you ended it on a very optimistic uh, and futuristic uh, goal and something that of course from the merit subcommittee we are also uh, promoting trying to promote uh, education transfer technology and that's uh, where we are at so um, I will hand it over to Dr. Sayed Uzair and Dr. Astar are here uh, as our moderators to please uh, say a few words, and then we will see what questions there are uh, in the Q&A. Thank you so much again. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sarfraz, and thank you very much, Professor Habib, for sharing such a wonderful and a great work. We know these are the issues so much prevalent in Pakistan. And uh, I think this is the field of Dr. Hamid Akhtar because he's a pediatrician and he's working on stunting. Uh, Dr. Hamid, please unmute yourself and share your views, please. Uh, thank you, Professor Bukhari. Uh, excellent talk. You have touched upon so many areas. Uh, that it is very difficult to keep the track which topics you are really doing. And you have also not only touched upon that, you have published the article and you have shown some improvement and the, with the data, not like just hearsay, there say. Uh, one special topic which is close to my heart being a pediatrician is the stunt, stunted growth in children. I have seen Dr. Bhutta and other um, uh, researchers has worked most of the um, stunting first thousand days of the life. So, and you also mentioned about this uh, 12 months to 36 months, and they are more severely stunting. And you mentioned one thing about the cognitive effect, which is true. Um, but what have you ever seen anything reversing, especially after five years of age? Because first three years of age, you can get some more energetic food and you get the stunting back and it has shown some um, data. Have you seen or done anything on the students or the, the children five to nine years of age where it is quite difficult to reverse them. Thank you, Dr. Saab, for asking this question. Uh, to start with, because uh, as I said, we are sitting in a resource deficient lab. We're trying to basically see that how with the one funding we can address five or six. This is this is how the laboratories are, the professor's laboratories are working. So we have not been able to take it further because what we have done, because we have done, we've recruited about 100 patients, for example, 100 children from a King Edward Medical University, what we did, and uh, we did all the measurements and everything and recruited them as per standards that these have been qualified as a standard, whether they took their fecal samples and studied their poll. That's what we did. And before that, we were also, as I said, the, the, the impetus or a drive for doing this work was all the work which we've been doing since 2009 on diarrheal disease. So that was the one which has led us and our laboratory was specialized in, in those areas. So we've been able to take advantage of that. So we're basically able to identify each and every etiology from the gut. And then all the etiology is associated with the gut microbiome. We pick one or two or three major determinants and see that how they are, when they are present and how they are changing the whole gut microbiome picture as a rogue bacteria or a rogue virus is something which we have done. So we've not seen the reverse even though we do have that recipe or a formula which we feel after having done this work, and these are the different uh, uh, ways to control them, we do have that a kind of a formula which we wanted to basically do and do the clinical trials later on. So this is something which we can work together and I've developed that formula which we feel that it can basically help us in addressing this issue and challenge as well, keeping in with the previous published work in this area. So there has been some work from Africa so this is in the form of a small biscuit, which is rich with certain ingredients and also addressing the gut health as well in terms of all those bugs which are interfering in the absorption of a nutrition. So this is the multiple things which we can perhaps do in future as well. I hope you are. So the next thing, yeah, thank you very much. The next thing, if you could put a little, yeah. I know you have talked about, about the genomic advancement in, in Pakistan's landscape of research. So anything is being set up. I mean, I know that one lab has been trying to set up at the University of Health Sciences, where are the, or, and also another one in the chemistry department of uh, University of Karachi. And 
in terms of how the world is adva- advancing where we as pakistani or pakistan diaspora is, is, is in that uh, in that race where we are and how we can improve that because this is something new era is opened and this is something we need to move forward to yeah so what is happening in pakistan you must be aware of the fact that the operating these machineries is becoming very expensive and that's what happened because the lab laboratories are mainly the graveyard of these machineries they're not being used because there are not many users attached with this to different centers or places which basically can help them to you know move and work economically so that model is lacking so that we need to first of all in order to efficiently engage we have seen nih has somehow started that work after covid because a lot of investment was carried out in the huge sequencing projects were involved so this is the kind there was a challenge and there was an opportunity now if that works we do not need to basically replicate that efforts everywhere maybe three or four centers are fine we can do that but this the work which i presented was a work where i was working in cambridge at the sanga center where this started many years ago but but 15 20 years ago we started working on a genomically all those campala bacter and the these come we will call them e coli these are the genome sequences the first time did that in order to understand the epidemiology and associated genome structure of these organisms is so important so we fill that gap now it become much easier and much cheaper now but as i said one of that's where the multidisciplinary approach is required epidemiologists working with the clinicians with they have to be you know otherwise it's become very difficult because we cannot replicate resource deficient laboratories and resources can be otherwise diluted so need to have a mechanism where all these different players should be working together in the advisory board in order to basically address this challenge and this is going to be a huge challenge in future to be honest with the amr to be honest with this covid 19 you can see another episode down the road as well you never know so these are the kind of a thing which we need to strengthen our provincial centers in order to address those challenges and basically coordinated effort is required now you remember that in you're sitting in a canada pro med may now was there any single small given or glues global learning works warning system based on these small information gathering through the mobile you can basically activate each and every one to be you know on alert as well so that how they can basically uh, by just understanding and disseminating the knowledge at the right time and the right place you can address the challenge that's what i basically said yeah i will ask so, let uh, dr hussain to ask any question if he want to ask the last question so um i think uh, it's uh, almost time uh, to end yeah. but there are two questions that are in the yeah. chat so uh, professor bukhari if you can hello hello ji yeah. so there hello? is yes professor so... sarvat good yes i'm just going to actually say a very a very quick comment that you know i've been a radiologist and subspecialist for a very very long time but i think gradually listening to what professor bukhari says i really think that primary care is the way to take care of our population and uh, you know all the money we spent on that we did our country did like 50 uh, mr scanners many of them are <laughs> not even functioning at this time probably uh, and the same money could have been spent on uh, you know a public health primary health and and research would have uh, touched and benefited such a large number of uh, patients so from radiologist to primary hair uh, primary uh, care physician that's what i want to convert to thank you uh, for a wonderful concentrated uh, uh, talk by professor pari thank you sir so thank i don't know if we have time uh so dr sarfaz so, i think uh, i have responded to one of the question and the okay. last is over to professor bukhari that maybe he can share somebody are requested for a summary of the total discussion so that they can take this message back home so after this please if you like you can share a very brief summary so that can be shared with some of the academician and the researchers so that that was the the question and now uh, it's over to uh, dr sarfraz hasni for formally closing this session and thanks to all of them including the moderator in, including the speaker and most important participant and the technical team over to you dr sarfraz
Okay, thank you so much. Uh, so um, with this, we will conclude yet another session of the Apna Merit webinar. And uh, first of all, thank you for all the participants for taking time. I know it's sort of uh, late in our in Pakistan, especially, um, but taking time to engage and to join. Uh, we may not have gotten to all of your questions, but we'll try as much as possible because of the time limitation. We try to finish in an hour. Um, a big thank you to Professor Bukhari for taking time out of his busy schedule and enlightening us with the research he has been involved with and also uh, sharing us uh, some vision and uh, future directions. And our moderators, um, Dr. Rosair, for always being there. He's the driving force behind all of this. And Professor Salvat Hussain, Professor uh, Amir Akhtar. Uh, and last but not least, the technical team uh, headed by Walid, uh, who, uh, who do a lot of work behind the scene, which goes unnoticed, but because of their hard work in the background, we are able to do these things uh, seamlessly. And it seems very easy, but I know there's so much work that goes behind it. So again, thank you to all of you. And uh, inshallah, looking forward to meeting all of you again in about two weeks from now. Uh, Saturday, same place, same time. Uh, just stay tuned for the announcement for the next webinar. Thank you and Assalamu alaikum and Khuda Peace, Assalamu alaikum. Wonderful meeting you all. Khuda Hafiz. <laughs>